Hey, hello everyone, and um, welcome back to this session that will start now soon. Uh, we have with us Elias Sadiq. So this session will be about um, poetry presentation from the perspective of an LGBTIQ activist uh, from the Muslim background. Hi, Elias. Hello. Uh, hello. So I will introduce you shortly and then I give you the mic so you have your time more. So Elias Sadiq is an award-nominated poet and self-published author and activist with a Danish-Moroccan background. Raised in Denmark, Elias' writing has been uh, described as a window into the world where love, culture, sex, religion, and queerness could. So the mic for you, Elias, and welcome. We're really happy to have you with us. Thank you. Um, can I see myself? Actually, I'm not sure. Yeah, we can see you. Okay, ah, okay. awesome. All right, uh, how's uh, it? One minute. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You can speak, Elias. Okay, all right. Well, uh, hello and uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. It's a very, very big honor, actually. Um, I think it's a really amazing initiative. Uh, I came running straight back from university. <laughs> so uh, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, of course, I have been watching some of the presentations and I think it's a really, it's, it's a really big honor to be a part of such an um, prestigious and really um, amazing uh, lineup actually. Um, also in, uh, of course, you guys know I'm, I'm speaking normally, I'm speaking Danish. So of course I'm in my mind, I'm translating live. So you might hear that a little bit. Uh, so please pardon me. Uh, but yes, a quick um, introduction of me is that uh, as Hassan, uh, mashallah, he gave me a beautiful introduction is I'm a 26 year old a Danish Moroccan student slash poet. Um, and I think uh, what I'm trying to bring here is maybe is not a, as much the academic angle, um, but maybe trying to bring a little bit more um, the art artistic angle, because usually I'm not really used to uh, being on this side of the screen, actually, because uh, of course I'm a student. So normally I'm the one who's watching the teachers. Uh, so for now, it's very interesting for me to be at this part. Um, but as I said, I'm trying, I think my contribution to this uh, seminar is trying to bring uh, maybe the artist perspective, which for me, uh, I want to also delve into later is, um, you know, I found is the most effective way for me to practice my activism, right? Uh, because of course, as uh, a lot of us, we have had different uh, roads in our activism and trying to find a place in, in a way, carving out the space for ourselves and other uh, LGBTQI uh, people and uh, yeah, faith. Uh, so I think that's what I'm trying to bring. But uh, as a beginning, actually, uh, I want to uh, read a part of my poetry collection and uh, as for now, it's primarily in Danish, but we have been translating some of it uh, uh, as a part of the international release. Um, and this part is a um, highlight of a monologue uh, I did during Pride Week. So it's a little bit like an, um, a kind of a text that has been sewn together from different, uh, uh, different poems, poems from my poetry collection into one whole monologue. Uh, yes, so let me uh, read uh, that for you. And uh, now I would say it would be the time to uh, grab a cup of coffee or maybe something like that uh, while I read it. Uh, all right, so please enjoy. And uh, the poetry collection is called uh, Gelstraer in Danish, which we would translate in English to Street Lines. <clears throat> a, loud a loud sci fi sound fills the darkness. The sound transforms to the sound of a teleporter beam. An alien beams down to earth. In a beam of light stands Elias, trapped like a deer, caught in the headlights. I saw you on the street back home in Aarhus. There you were at a distance and we instantly made eye contact. Homo, what makes you Muslim? Shame on you. I wanted to run into your arms again. I wanted to tear you into 10,000 pieces. Instead, I turned around and went the other way. 
You haven't been by my side for two years and I still miss you every single day. I still remember the time you and I walked hand in hand to Friday prayers at the mosque and how your beard tickled and scratched my face when you insisted that I kiss you. I still remember how proud you got when all your friends told you how much they all wanted to give their daughters away in marriage to me. Baba, this last year I've screamed to the heavens. Didn't you hear me? I've prayed until my knees bled in pace with my crushed heart. Didn't you see me? Every day I've stared into the darkness, convinced it was the only place I could find peace, a peace which I could never find within myself. Peace from shame, lies, fear, and hatred. Hatred towards you, hatred towards my God, and hatred towards myself. I have tanks, you have stones. The schoolyard is Gaza Gelob. That's the game we like to play. The rest of your family still lives in Palestine. So you lead the game, I follow, and you proudly lead the way. You're my best friend, but in the 30 minutes we have, re we have for recess, we are mortal enemies with branches for weapons and stones for guns. We look tough with pockets filled with bullets. But in reality, we are delicate boys, boys made of glass. Ali, are you okay? We were best friends, but you don't answer when I call. You say you are busy and promise to call back but I'm always left alone, missing the days where it, was just, where it was just you and I, two kids in a concrete jungle without a care, with only our love to share. You tell me stories about your father's heroism, about the bullet scars on his hip. You also have scars, but they can't be seen by the naked eye. You are the son of a refugee, I'm not, but we both come from homes at war. You tell me about the war in Palestine and why we should hate the Jews. I'm not in agreement, but think, how can one hate a person they've never met? But I love you, so I hate them, because your pain is my pain. We fight a fight that is bigger than us. Alone in my apartment, with only the gray concrete ghetto walls as my view. Walls so high that it is hard to glimpse the horizon from here. From my place at the window, I look into the apartments on the wall across the streets, and I often wonder what kind of lives are being lived behind those colorful curtains and heavy concrete walls. On my trip through Morocco, I met a young man. He had curls like mine, black hair and brown eyes. He told me that he lived with the same fear as I. He told me about a life in darkness and despair. He had no opportunity for love in this life. I didn't either, I replied, and cried all the way home to Casablanca. I did my best every day to navigate life as a young man without a role model. I had no one to mirror myself in, no one to guide me and show me the way. So I had to do it on my own. It, had it has caused me problems and I've made a lot of mistakes, Baba. Back then, I was just a little boy with smooth cheeks and big round eyes. Today, I am a man and my beard has grown longer than yours, Baba. Baba, I built my walls so high out of fear that someone would look in so high that I no longer could see out myself. I have lied so much to all of you and to myself that when I look in the mirror, 
I no longer recognize myself. I can't lie anymore. That isn't the life that I want to live or the man I want to be. I don't want to live in fear because I don't fear anyone. I want to forgive you for my own sake, but some nights anger is the only thing I have. It fills me, it makes me big and strong. It holds me warm and burns the deprivation away. So I must feed it every day because I fear what's hiding in the dark. Baba, I gave my heart to a man. That isn't a sin. As it is, as it, as is, as it is written, so it shall be done. You taught me that. You don't understand it yet, but perhaps one beautiful day you will. I pray every day for that to happen still. I have no shame in me. This is my life, and this is the path I must take with or without you. Take my home away and take back your love. But the faith you gave me is mine forever. I am a Muslim. I walk with God long before I found my love and that I always, I always will with or without your blessing. <clears throat> Saturday night, it's five o'clock. Music increases. It's my first time I'm at a gay bar. The first time I drink alcohol. Men kissing men. Before the night is over, are you going home with me? Are you not scared to be seen? I ask while you pour my glass. Saturday night, I have butterflies in my stomach. What would your girl say if she knew you were riding me? I dance around on, rhyme, on rainbows with glitter in my hair. I sit at the corner of the street and kiss with brown men. You always ride me after five o'clock. Music suddenly stops. Ali, are you okay? Do you remember those days when I had nowhere to stay and you took me in side by side on the bed? I feel your body without touching you. You keep my secret and I keep yours. Suddenly, a stone hits me on the forehead and everything goes black, but there is no pain. Pictures of bombs and buildings on fire dance in my head. My legs buckle under me and I hear the sound of gravel crunch as my body hits the asphalt hard. The pain grips me immediately and it wails in my ears, but the only thing I hear is Death to all Jews, you yell triumphantly and laugh. I hear your voice, but it's another man's words that comes out of your mouth. Is this how it feels to be dead, I think? Ellie, are you okay? Would you ever tell me if you weren't? Or will I find you hanging from a street, from a street lamp with a noose around your neck. Ellie, will you please call me? Silence sinks and the wind washes the playground clean from our destruction. Your small shoes scrape against the asphalt in rhythm with, your, with you hesitatingly taking steps towards me. Warmth drips on my forehead. Is it rain? I carefully open my eyes. And there you are, my best friend standing, crying over me. Without saying anything, you lay down beside me and, and gently take my hand in yours. Ellie, are you okay? A musical beat starts softly in the background. Baba, I want my heart to be mine again. I wish to feel my, I wish to feel my heart as my home, something to call my own. I want to fill my house with light 
with flowers and things that grow. The bee grows stronger. Ailey enters and sits beside Silius. 8220, all who's west. A real gangster drives a BMW. He does. A black ice cold E30 with shining chrome rims. I sit in my regular place on the passenger seat and my eyes blink in rhythm with the street lights as they hit the windshield. I have butterflies in my stomach and my glove compartments are filled with drugs. Ali lays his hand carefully on my neck and strokes, and strokes me lovingly up and down. I want to be alone with you, Habibi, he says. I'm done hiding. I'm gonna tell the world. His words flow together and I can only hear my heart pounding in the rhythm with the bass from the music playing softly from the speakers. We both stare at the road ahead, but out of the corner of my eye, I can see his silhouette. I can see the hard look in his eyes and his pointed nose that runs down into a flippant smile. He smells of cheap perfume. Come on, my love. Don't make me sit here in silence, he says frustrated and looks at me. He is the first man I've ever loved and he swears the same is true for me. I look for an answer, but have nothing to say. We live for this moment, late summer nights in his car. We will leave, he says. We will drive to Marrakesh, you and I, and we'll move into the blue garden. And there we'll stay until we die far away from concrete and cement. Ailey slowly removes his hands from my neck. I roll the window up and we drive further without saying a word. We continue driving the whole night long until he finally pulls into an empty resting area and parks the car. He turns off the motor and lights a joint. I only smoke when I'm with him, so I, hesit so I hesitantly take the little joint. Habibi, I don't think that God cares about a little joint, he says and laughs. Besides, you and I, we've already sinned in much bigger ways. He doesn't believe in God, I do, but here in his car behind Behind the tinted windows, God can't see us. He gives me a long kiss. I feel his beard stubble scratch my face and the heavy smell of sweat that mixes with the smoke from the lit joint and his perfume. My mouth fills with the taste of ashes and my chest burns. I feel wrong and I feel dirty, but in his presence, I am forever happy. After the kiss, he leans back and looks seriously at me before he says, let's run away from here. While we have time on our side and our legs can, can still carry us. He is engaged and has to marry a girl from the block in six months. I slowly reach my hands down to the top of his pants. I can only hear his heavy breathing. I have his whole world in my mouth and he has my whole heart in his hands. Two gangsters in a BMW with just a dream. All right, so uh, <laughs> that was the uh, excerpt that I wanted to read out loud for you guys. I hope you liked it. Um, normally, it's easier to uh, you know gauge than audience res uh, res reaction by watching your faces, but um, so yes, this is a small um, excerpt from my poetry collection, 
And uh, I, actually, I wanted to read it before I gave a proper introduction to what actually led into me writing uh, poetry and getting into writing, actually, just in general. Um, because I wanted to let the words speak uh, for themselves. Um, but yes, just to give you guys a little bit background information, as Hassan, he said, um, I'm a 26-year-old uh, cis gay man uh, from a small city in Denmark called Aarhus. Which, which is actually the second biggest city in Denmark, uh, but uh, which is not a lot compared to a lot of other major countries and cities. But yeah, um, I grew up in uh, what some people uh, would call public housing, or some some what some people in or some people in the government in Denmark has classified as a ghetto, right? Uh, which is actually made of of different criteria, but uh, which is decided upon the fact of how many minority a lot of people of minority descent that lives there right so i would say you know i grew up in a very rough environment and uh, in an environment that has got a lot of negative press in denmark uh, an environment that has been um, how could you say affected by a lot of drugs and uh, criminal activity in different ways right um, and a lot of violence as well in different ways uh, of course, that's not only the only part of the community I grew up in. I would say the community I grew up in was a community of love and uh, a lot of difference. I grew up a lot in around a lot of different cultures, you know. Um, the community I grew up around, uh, you know, according to statistics, houses uh, around 28 different uh, ethnic minorities in I don't know how small a square per mile, right? So I grew up uh, around a lot of different people, right? Primarily, I would say there were a lot of people from Somali, Somali descent, a lot of people from Palestinian descent as well, uh, a lot of immigrants, but primarily a lot of refugees as well. Our parents were refugees, right? And uh, as I said earlier, my dad, he's Moroccan, right? So I'm not, I'm not from a refugee uh, descent, but I am of immigrant descent, of course, with the fact that uh, my dad, he married a Danish woman, right? Um, and uh, my mom, she uh, actually converted when she met my father, right? And she's been a Muslim for ever since. And she, they got married, uh, I think maybe they had an Islamic wedding when I think she was 18 around that time, right? So my mom has uh, practically been a Muslim for the most part of her life, right? Um, yeah. So I grew up in a very diverse community, but I would say I, grew, I also grew up in a very strict, uh, conservative Muslim community. Uh, and uh, I don't know, you know, uh, how you guys grew up or which kind of uh, uh, Muslim heritage or practice you guys grew up in. But I would say, actually, uh, strangely enough, because I'm mixed, I would say I grew up in a, in a household that was... Uh, in compared to my peers, a lot, you know, a lot of ways, uh, extremely more conservative, actually. And I want to share a, a personal anecdote with you guys from my upbringing, um, which is actually, I would say, was the first time ever uh, anything LGBT related ever was mentioned in my household. And as, as I said, I grew up in a very strict Muslim uh, conservative householding, you know. My dad, he was the patriarch, right? He was the one who uh, uh, ensured that um, the Mus my Muslim heritage and culture was uh, delivered to his children, right? Um, and, I, he, and I had, how would you, would you say, that is or like... Um, Muslim lectures by my dad, right? And that was, that was a regular thing in the household I, I grew up in. Uh, we had to study the Quran. We had to learn it uh, by memory, you know. Maybe some of you guys uh, can relate to that if you grew up in a strict uh, or in, in maybe in a conservative household, right? But I would say it was in a, you know, uh, the way God was implemented in our life was uh, definitely as an authority or as a way of maybe controlling us. I think my father, he used uh, his religion or his faith to also find an identity as well, right? Because he came from a different country. He was not accepted in Denmark by Danish people due to being different, right? So his religion in a way became the anchor he used to identify himself. But I think it became so much that he really wasn't able to, I don't know, um, 
I don't know, really understand how to find the balance between being religious and living in a modern uh, society in the West, right? But uh, let me share with you the anecdote, um, the, the, the anecdote where, you know, my dad, he, for the first time ever, told me about something LGBTQ related. And this was the first time I remember, and I remember this vividly, you know, through our life, we have, through our lives, we have these moments, you know, or these memories that shine bright, uh, these moments that define us as human beings that we can never forget, right? And I would say this is one of those moments for me. And I would say I was, I was not very old when this happened, but um, it's something I will never forget, right? And uh, pardon me, right? Because it's a little painful memory, but I was very young. I was maybe around 12. And um, I remember, you know, my dad, he would always sit on the floor, mashallah, with the Quran. He would always sit on his knees and he would sit on the lambskin table in his bedroom. And, you know, this this was the sacred space in a way, right? Because when dad, he uh, lets you into the bedroom, we, you know, we're not allowed to know what's going on in the bedroom, right? So I knew, okay, he, he for the <laughs> you know uh he called me and i have sisters and brothers as well but this time he only called me and i remember thinking that was weird right because when when we had the muslim lectures it was with everybody in the family right and i actually look back at those memories fondly because these was the story these people the, the stories he told me was the tales of heroes right this was the prophets the sahaba it was like listening to fantasy stories, you know, when the prophet, he, he rode out into war and, you know, the prophets, uh, uh, you know, spacing the water, walking on water, right? This was like uh, our 20, 20 Mar Marvel superheroes, right? So, so, so primarily those memories are fond memories for me. But he, I remember he, call, he called me into his, uh, his bedroom. And, and, you know, you always go in with a little bit of hesitation or a little bit of nervousness. But then he sat me just right in front of me. He said, I want to talk to you about something, right? And I said, okay, what, what is happening, right? I'm 12 years old. And then he, 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 he started beginning telling me a story, right? And, and I'm trying to uh, <laughs> tell you guys it verbatim because I remember it vividly. But he, he started uh, randomly telling me about LGBTQI people, right? But he told me in the sense of what would happen to them at Yom al Qiyamah in the Day of Judgment, right? And I'll never forget this. He told me that since the beginning of time, um, the angels have forged a coffin made of pure steel, which has been in hell since the beginning of time. And which is glowing of red, which is red glowing, as you know, when iron, when iron or metal gets heated up, it starts to glow red. And at the end, at the at the Yom Qiyamah, the Judgment Day, at the end of times, every LGBT person will be banished inside that coffin, and the angels will come, and they will shut the lid of the coffin with nails, iron nails, and the people in the coffin will stay there till forever. And the coffin will be banished to an, um, you know, an distant area of hell, never to be opened again, right? And that, imagine, I was 12 years old, right? This was the first time anybody in my family actually ever mentioned anything with lgbtq people i don't think i even understood what being gay was at that point right because i was not there in my mind or thinking at all right but uh i just uh, and then he just let me go and i and at that time i didn't really think of much of that right i just thought that was a really gruesome image you know even as a child i could never forget it because it was such a vivid image you know imagine being you know, who, who, who is even able to uh, describe such a picture, actually? Who can write such an uh, uh, image? You know, me, me as an author and a poet, you know, it's really a strong, vivid image. Imagine shutting people down in a coffin, in a red glowing coffin uh, till, till, till forever, right? 
Um, but right, so I carried that memory with me, or that lecture with me, right? As time went on, as I grew older. And, um, you know, as we grow older, we start to get into our teenage years, of course, I start to question myself and do the normal questions that people do. But I remember I asked my mom, I would ask my mom, I would say, oh, when do I, when, when, when I'm gonna fall in love? I've never fall, fallen in love. I've never fallen in love with a girl. I told my mom, when is it gonna happen? You know, kind of like impatient or anxious. Like, when is it gonna happen to me, the thing of falling in love, right? I was very obsessed because I was the kid who had a lot of friends who were girls, right? Um, this, I was the sensitive boy in a way, you know? I, I was a sensitive boy in a rough environments, right? Uh, so I was, I was waiting, I was wondering, right? But I, I'd, I'd never, in a way, connected the dots, you know, or even could think of, I could have been gay or being other, or being queer in any way possible, right? Because first and foremost, first and foremost, my identity was, well, I was a Muslim. That was the thing I was. That was how I identified myself. And my dad, the person, you know, I trusted uh, mostly that, you know, as we do, we trust what people say, especially as children, right? We're so easily manipulated. He told me that you cannot be Muslim and gay. It's the thing that, that isn't, it's like, um, in my head, it, it was like a um, mathematical equation that didn't, uh, it, it was like a mathematical equation that there was no solution to, you know? It's like uh, dividing by zero. You cannot, it's, it's not possible to align those two things, right? So it was like, I could never even think about uh, being gay and Muslim because it's two things that's not even, uh, yes, you cannot connect those things. So I waited, right? Uh, and I lived my life. I kept on going. And, you know, of course, we came from a very pious religious background. We went to mosque all, all Friday and, you know, and... Then I grew a little bit older and then I actually, I moved away from home. I went, I entered the military actually as well, you know, cause I felt like I had to prove something to myself as well. The sensitive boy who had to like, uh, I don't know, prove his own masculinity towards himself, you know, uh, cause I was always in a way shunned maybe for my sensitive side cause I was a writer, you know, but even back then I was writing, you know, I was always sitting in my room, trying to express myself in a way, because we grew up in an environment where we were, we were not allowed to express ourselves, right? We were not allowed to express our pain. So what, what do you do when you cannot express your pain out loud? You write it down, right? So that was, my, that was always my approach to it. But, um, you know, so, so, so I was in the military, you know, I was in my late teenage years, 19, 20. Then I came back. And I, I, I waited a little bit. We said, I think it's, we, say, we call it, it, a, it's, it a sabbatical. We, I think we call it, right? Where like they say young people try other things. Because I've been studying my whole life. Everything I've ever done. I've been, I've been going to school my whole life, right? So instead I took some time off. And those times, I think that was where a change happened. Because I got a job where I was around a person who was gay, actually. And th this was the first time I was around a gay person. Like, it was a shock to me, you know? Um, but, but we had a lot of discussions, you know? And I think just by being in a pro proximity to him in a way, it's, you know, made me confront a, some things, you know, uh, towards myself. But I would say, you know, of course you always have the, uh, how do you say, like, you know, you have in a way the, essence of who you are you can feel it inside you know you always know but maybe you are not ready to accept it and i was that guy you know i maybe i knew it in a way but I, I could not i could not find the connection with being muslim and being gay right and at that time is the same time actually i started writing writing my poetry actually this was the time uh, I would also say when I look back at that time, that was one of the most hardest times of my life, actually, because I was so divided between who I wanted to be or what I felt like 
and mm-hmm. what I thought was my obligations towards my God, right? Uh, because if you also heard a little bit some of the poetry, right? It's like, um, it's the hatred towards, I wrote the hatred towards you, towards my God and towards myself, right? It's the self-hate. Um, but so at that time I, I was writing my poetry, I was dealing with a lot of suicidal thoughts heavily every day i would say at the time of my life actually uh, though for like three months period uh, every day when i woke up and i think this is a very important topic for us to be talking about you know uh, mental health especially as lgbtq people especially lgbtq people who are minorities right so i was dealing with uh, with suicidal thoughts every single day right and uh, i reached the uh, the point of no return or my breaking point where I don't know, I cannot say what the leading factors to it was. I, th- I just thought I maybe I just had enough. And uh, if you have ever, if you ever come to Aarhus, which is my hometown, you'll see it's a it's a harbor city. It's close to the waters, right? So I remember it was a Thursday night. I went down to the harbor, and uh, this was the moment where I said to myself, "Okay, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm done." Because if I cannot be who I, this was the boy in me, right? I was still waiting to fall in love, right? It's like, uh, or, or at least uh, uh, giving myself the permission to fall in love, right? And I said to myself, if I have to live my whole life without ever experiencing love or the feeling of love, that's not a life worth living, right? And you know, if you're a Muslim or a people, person of faith, you know, suicide is the ultimate uh, how do you say, like, um, it's the ultimate going against the will of God, right? It's like taking something sacred or actually, yeah, yeah, I don't know. But of course, we know as Muslims or people of faith, suicide is the ultimate taboo, right? So I was really split in between that. Like, should I, I was like, okay, should I like go to hell for being gay or should I go to hell for suicide, right? <laughs> but, um, right, so... I thought it, I thought I had like this glimmer of hope or something, which is the funny thing about being a person of faith. It's having faith or believing, right? So I always had to, I think that was the beautiful thing that my faith gave me or my father, he gave me, right? It was my faith, the, the belief in it will always get better. So I was standing here in the middle of the night. It was a stormy night. The wind was howling, you know. I was just looking across the seas and looking at, at the waves and thinking, okay, I'm going to jump in. But instead, I decided to write, or I decided to take my phone and Google, like, LGBTQ and my hometown, right? And then I found a hotline for some, like, LGBT hotline calling in, something like youth phone, right? And I said, okay, before, before you jump in, at least you have to take or try to do a step to do something to prohibit it, right? So I called them, and this is the first time I ever called in or in a way confronted my sexuality identity, right? Um, so I called in, um, and this is a funny story actually. Uh, it's, uh, I think it was a young man, I assume from the, from the voice, right? And you know, I'm gonna go even further assuming he sounded very white, you know? Because as soon as I called, I started telling my story, right? Like my family, the culture, what I was caught in between, right? Like culture, family, religion, sexuality. Uh, and I remember he was silent. Like the phone was dead silent for like 20 seconds. And I was like, did he hang up? <laughs> and then he answered. He was like, whoa, I can't relate to that. He said, because my parents were very accepting when I came out. And I just remember, I was like, I just lost my, I, I, my jaw dropped, you know? Cause I was like, what? This is the first time I ever told anybody about, you know, these really, really private things. And this is what you have to tell me like. <laughs> um, but then he said something, and this is the phone call that changed my life actually. Then he told me, listen, I'm, I, maybe I can relate to you. Maybe I cannot understand you but I have these people who might be able to, and this is the phone line you need to call. And then he directed me to an organization called Sabah, spelled S 
A B A A H, which is a Danish uh, organization for uh, LGBTQIA min uh, people of minority descent, right? So not necessarily LGBTQI people of faith, but just uh, people of my uh, of minority descent, right? And this is the first time I ever heard this before. And he says to me, you gotta be quick, right? Because they're closing, the phone line is closing in like 20 minutes. And then I hang up immediately. And I called the line and the person who picked up is a person you, I would say all of you should definitely know. His name is Fahad Said, which is like, he's like, yeah, he's like the front runner in Denmark for LGBTQ people. Okay, yes, exactly. That's a link in the chat, exactly. Um, yes. So he picked up the phone. Fahad is also Pakistani and he's also Muslim, right? So I could, re I could relate to him in that way. But this was literally the first time I ever spoke to somebody else like me. Because probably like a lot of you guys, as I said, uh, the environment I grew up in was very tough. You had to be tough, right? I maybe you guys relate to this. I literally thought the only LGBTQ Muslim in the whole wild world, you know? This is the loneliness we deal with, right? The delusion we deal with. We think we're the only one because we have been so, how do you say, we have been so, um, I don't know, erased from history, right? Erased from culture, right? So I re literally thought I was the only one in the whole world. But Fahad, he said something that in a way like, you know, you feel like sometimes uh, people can say stuff that almost like it's like keys that op open doors in your mind, right? But he said to me, he said, yeah, yes. When you go to mosque, when you go to Friday pri prayer, and when you put your head down in, in praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you, do you really think, are you really that arrogant to believe that you are the only person that's gay in that space <laughs> he said statistically that doesn't even make any sense right and just just that short um, way of thinking it changed my whole uh, outlook you know because of course i could not be the only one logically that wouldn't make any sense right um so of course it has just been a thing about us have been erased right and also the way uh, the story about my father trying to erase my possible identity, right? Because maybe today I'm asking myself, okay, why would he tell me that uh, story, right? Maybe because he had a premonition or he had a feeling in a way, right? But I would say that was actually my, my th that uh, phone call was my entry into activism in a way, because I got actively involved with Sabah in my hometown before I moved to Copenhagen where I live now, right? And I can see that the time is encroaching. So uh, I want to say that I spent a lot of years working with Sabah, working in Sabah, and I still am working. I would say Sabah is my family, you know. Those are the people who saved my life, right? But I also quickly found out in a way uh, the approach to activism, you know, and maybe this is my youth, the youth in me speaking, you know, I felt like the approach to activism, maybe it's just a Danish thing. I don't know. Maybe you guys can relate, but it comes with a lot of compromises, you know, especially if you want to do it in an organizational matter, right? It's because Sabah, for example, that's a nonprofit, right? So that means we rely on uh, donations. We rely on state funding. So, um, when you have to do that kind of activism, you have to enter different kind of spaces, right? You have to enter political spaces. And I knew from the get-go, I was not a politician, right? I, ca I cannot be that guy. I was a storyteller, right? But I tried to be the politician type, but I just realized that was not the person I, I was. I was always an author. I was always the poet, right? So I decided to use my poetry to do my activism in a way, right? Um, also because I had a need, of course, just to tell my story in a way, just to, uh, in a way, crystallize the pain. And also felt like, because um, <laughs> I think when you start to get into the, the whole LGBTQ Muslim thing, you start reading all the books you're able to find, you know, all the academic articles, you do all the research. And I read all the books, you know, I read all the articles. I spent like uh, my first year at the university manically 
reading all the articles, every digging everything I could find, right? But in a way, you know, what I was missing, what I was missing in relation relating to was the art, the art and culture, right? I feel like that was what I was missing, right? So I started to dig more into that. That was where I was a little bit more interesting because I was like, it cannot be possible that uh, we have been existing to, throughout the ages, but there's no art, there's no literature, there's, there's no like a historical evidence of us. So I became more interested in poetry, right? In that way and poetry also as like an historical, it's like in, um, you know, leaving like an historic time capsule in a way, right? Uh, so began began becoming more interested in uh, Arabic male to male love poetry, which if you could do a little bit, if you want to, you could do a little bit of reading of it. You would see that that was a whole literature, literary genre in the Middle East, right? Uh, there, there was there has been produced volumes and volumes of male to male uh, Arabic uh, um, love poetry. Uh, so in a way, that's also where where I do find my inspiration, right? Um, and also, I feel like I want to contrib contribute to that heritage, actually. I feel like it's, in a way, my responsibility, in a way. That's where I receive my inspiration from. I want to add on to that heritage that has been erased, right? I'm thinking about myself in a, in a, like an historical perspective, like 100 years from now, Allah Alam, inshallah, you know? People, people, young people, people from around the world might look back at it look back at it. Uh, so I feel like that's the visibility I want to add on. That's how I do my activism, right? That's what I want to leave behind. Um, so I think, yes, uh, I don't know. Do we have like, I think we have 15 minutes left. Uh, I want to leave a space for uh, questions as well. Sorry, what are you saying, Hassan? Um. <laughs> Yes, you hear me now, yes? Yes, I can hear you. So, yeah, I want to tell first, thank you so, so much for this sharing of your, like, yeah, personal story and all your kind of the background, everything you tell. And I can tell you here, the studio, you have mixed feelings. <laughs> so, <laughs> emotion, tears, and like excitement. So, so many things, yeah. And I can tell you personally, I relate so much about to be with my personal experience with what you tell. So I know very well this kind of discussion with the father in the, <laughs> in the room as they come. So I know what it means this. So yeah, I want to ask um, the people who are with us here, if anyone want to share something, put a comment or asking a question. Yes, please. You can write or turning your mic on and talk directly. And please feel free to ask any question. I would say, I answer all questions, and if there's something I'm com uncomfortable answering, I will tell you. So just feel free asking anything. Hello. Yes, we have uh, one question. Hello. Um, I'm Iman from South Africa. Hello. Um, hey, Elias. <laughs> um, I want to ask um, how how do you feel about your reflection on um, sharing such vulnerability to strangers, and um, how much of those strangers actually relate to what you're going through, and how much more explaining do you need to do with people that are not queer Muslim? Mm. Thank you for your question, Iman. I think it's a very, very good question, actually. Um, and, you know, also as being 26, you know, I feel like I'm still doing a lot of the discovering myself, but it's a very good question because I would say my whole, um, how do you say, start into uh, being a poet and an author, actually, was the fact that, uh, you know, I wrote like an, uh, how would you say, like an uh, poem in a way. I published it online on my social media and it began trending. Um, and people, 
in Denmark started sharing it, journalists started sharing it, people I never knew started sharing it, politicians started sharing it, right? And my whole uh, approach to it was not that I, 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 at that point, I didn't even think that far. I just had something to get off my chest, you know? I, I, I did it for um, egotistical reasons, right? I did it because I had to, to get something out of my chest, right? But then it started snowballing. And uh, it's, it, as, as you're saying, it like, it stopped becoming my own story. I felt like it became everybody else's story. It became a political tool as well, right? Because politicians re reposted it and were like, this is the reason why, duh, 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 or we should focus on, duh, 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 or these are the, duh, 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 right? You know. Uh, and then I started to, uh, in a way, it kind of really like, um, changed my whole mind or approach to sharing or art actually and that's how in a way that experience in a way was the one of the founding steps from for me to release my poetry collection right because not only did i write a poetry collection i self-produced it i self-released it i released it on my own publishing uh line right because i felt like I had to, I had, now I did have, now, now I did share my story, right? But I didn't want it just to become like an, uh, I don't know, a, a, a quick thing on social media or like somebody else's story. I wanted to take control of the narrative myself, right? So now I feel like um, I only share uh, what I want to share with people, right? Uh, I think the way I released my poetry collection is actually me trying to regain or retake the control of that moment because that was a really, and because I know I am very aware of what the things I'm sharing are very vulnerable, right? But I think like when I put it into my poetry, when I um, manifested in that way, you know, also in a physical form, right? Because now my words and also now my pain exist in in a physical war, form, right? Uh, and now I can give that away to other people in a, in a sense. Um, but I, just to, uh, <laughs> in a way to wrap around your question very quick, I think it's like, um, in a way, I think it's my job as an artist as well to give these stories out, you know, and uh, when I feel like when I have given them, they belong to the world, right? And uh, they're meant to go around, they're meant to be shared, they're meant to be inspired, to inspiring people. Um, but yeah, it's a really good question. Actually, sometimes you find yourself on a stage, right? You're performing and almost like disassociating from the pain of what you're sharing and the stories you're sharing, right? Just to get through it. Um, so I think, you know, uh, I don't have a clear cut answer to it, but I think it's an important question. And I think it's important to do the self-examination as to how you're sharing, what you're sharing and why you're sharing, you know? But then I also want to take to give an advice out to people actually in, in a, the, the ego, then maybe the, the narcissist in me is share your story, however you feel like, in, a, in, a, in however way you feel necessary or the way you feel you need to, you know, and uh, that doesn't matter who you're sharing it to. Um, but yes, I feel like uh, my whole goal and motivation for being here is just like, I don't know. It's to motivate or inspire people or to plant seeds for the next generation to come as well. That's what I'm thinking a lot of. <laughs> so I think that's my answer to your question, man. Thank you, Ilyes, for the answer. And I think you have the chat in front of you. We have one other question here. So I can read it if you want. Please do. Yes. Now it's another coming, but I will do this first. Yeah, from me, right? the question is like, first and foremost, thank you so much, Elias. And uh, I really loved the, your presentation. I have two questions. What advice do you have for someone who's trying to reconcile their faith and queerness? This is number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, what are your key source or method for spiritual empowerment? Oh, that's a, really, yes. that's a good question, actually, because... Yeah. How does one reconcile their faith and queerness, you know? Mm, because I feel like I've definitely been the person who has my, uh, the struggle with that for me was like, it was so painful. It, it was like a, almost like a physical pain, you know, the, the split of that in between me, you know? 
but how does one rec reconcile those two things? You know, I think like, I think it's starting to delve into the love of faith. You know, I think that's the most important part of it, right? Because as I said, I grew up in a very conservative and very like in the household where God, he was, you know, he was the Rahman, you know, he was the, he was the, how do you say, the, the empathic God, but he was also, also the judgmental God in a way, right? So I feel like if you want to con con reconcile those two thing, uh, things, I think you need to delve into the love of your faith, you know, connecting with that part of it. Um, and I know it's maybe it's not, it's, it's, it's it's not a good answer, you know, but I feel like, at least in Denmark, my own personal observation is that uh, the Muslim community in Denmark is very quick to police your religion. You know, I think that's, that's, I think maybe that's also like a general thing in Western Islam or Western Muslim community. People are very quick to police your, your religion, right? So I feel like it's very important to take, regain or retake your, um, relationship with your faith and the creator right if you believe in that uh, so feel like you know the thing about being queer is also being left out or being othered right and i feel like you have to also it might not be the best best uh, advice but it's like you have to find the power of being othered and being left out in a way you know uh to say i have not been left out i am standing outside on purpose you know i'm like in my own space you know and just regain that space um so i feel like it's like um i would almost say it's like stop caring what other people say i start believing that god he is all loving and yes all forgiving as well you know and give yourself the same forgiveness you believe God, he extends to all Muslims, or all people of faith, you know. Um, and of course, you know, it also, also helps try to find people to reflect yourself in or try to find academic literature to, to reflect you in or start to, to find it in art, you know. And no, I think that's a running or occurring thing. No, we have always been here and we will always be here, right? Um, so yes. I think that's maybe, you know, that's my method, you know, because people always want the clear cut solution. And I, would say, I don't have it, but. Uh, Elias, yes, sorry. <laughs> because yes, I'm done, I'm sorry. Of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. We, we can send uh, some question to you later if it's possible to write some answer. <laughs> but we have one last uh, question. I will share it now from Elena. Do you know in Denmark or internationally other poets who write from the perspective of queer Muslim? Or mm. have other uh, linked mind people who also write uh, as peer support? Mm. Also, if you want to recommend some poet, would love to hear. Yes. Okay. That's then you're hitting me right on the nail, but you know, of course, one that's maybe you know, of course, he's long dead and gone. But some person that inspired me a lot is Abu Nuwas. Let's say everybody who's interested in Arabic poetry, love poetry, I would say definitely you should go ahead and read some of Abu Nuwas's work, which is also like it has definitely like an edge to it, which I like to or to see even back then you could write being a little bit like dirty and being a little bit like non-caring. Uh, so I think a person like Abu Nuwaz. Now, and also, of course, um, I'm blanking on a little bit of his name is he's a Moroccan author. He's gay as well. I cannot remember his name right now, but maybe I should formulate a little, a little list maybe and I could post it later uh, and send that. Abdullah Taya, yes, of course. Um, but yes, um, I would say Khalid Ismail as well is a po is an author as well who writes from Middle Eastern queerness. Maybe Islam is not the focus as much. And I would say maybe I thought, that, which is also I think which is also adding on to my approach is like uh, I couldn't even, I couldn't find it, so I had to produce it in a way. And I think that's uh, in a way a lot of uh, the the underlining approach to what I do, you know? Uh, so yes, yeah, some of those people, but maybe I could formulate a list later and uh, send it out because I cannot remember all the people who I want to name right now, but there are a lot of people, you know, uh, people who are also not really published, you know, because 
it's hard to get published get published on a in a mainstream level as well we have people writing everywhere but it's you know it's like a, not on a mainstream scale yet so yes Thank you, Elias. And uh, I think now already we use all our time. I want to tell yeah. that we will be in contact with you soon more to ask about some question and also for further cooperation between uh, Bura, our um, LGBTIQ plus Muslim organization in Finland that we start, and Sabah, and definitely with Maruf. I can see that you know here already in the room. Soon we have a now small break, and in 15 minutes we will start uh, our panel discussion. That it will start exactly at 3:30. Yeah, 